So this is Sam Tomlin's set. This is set two of uh, Quinny's. Uh, you can see that the set is kind of slightly more intimate. Um, it doesn't have the spectacular um, antiques uh, that Quinny has in his sanctuary. Um, Tomlin uh, is his um, brother-in-law. He's a dealer in, well, he lives in the Fulham Road, but he's actually dealing in Bond Street. So he's made it right to the top of the tree, if you like, of antique dealing. Um, but unlike Quinny, who's really interested in the beauty of antiques and owning antiques, as well as buying and selling them, Tomlin seems to be more interested in just taking the profit out of antiques. So he doesn't, he doesn't surround himself with antiques, despite the fact that this, these are now considered to be antiques. But remember, this is 1915. Um, so what we have is a table that dates from about 1915, you know, an Edwardian dining table, which wouldn't have been antique. So this is Sam Tomlin using modern furniture. Likewise, the little cabinet at the back dates from around about 1890, 1900. So again, not an antique in 1915. These chairs, um, which we managed to, all of this is, again has been loaned by um, ex-antique dealers and antique dealers. Um, these chairs, which are, date from around 1815, so these are Regency. Um, these would not yet be fashionable in 1915. It's not until the 1920s that this kind of furniture um, becomes fashionable. And don't forget, in 1915, this is only just 100 years old. Um, so it's kind of on the edge of second hand, unfashionable rather than antique. Um, so he's, we, we try to assemble this set as if it's somebody who's wealthy enough to buy modern furniture, but also maybe inherited some furniture from his grandparents or his parents. And we imagine that this might be uh, Sam Tomlin's father and Sam Tomlin's mother. Uh, these are um, paintings on porcelain of around about 1850. So, you know, just about um, the right age for Tomlin's uh, parents. Uh, and some of the other pictures, they don't, none of these pictures, unlike uh, Quinney's Sanctuary, where the objects have a deliberate and strategic relationship to the dialogue in the play, um, most of the, in fact, all of the objects in, in this set don't really participate in, in that kind of relationship with the actors. And they're not characters in the play that the way some of the objects in Quinney's set are characters. So these are just dressings, really. But the, pa the paintings, again, are just general furnishing paintings of the period. These are, this is a, um, I, despite the fact that one is framed in cream and one is framed in gold, these are by the same artist, an artist called Joseph Nash, um, who's quite a, a famous antiquarian painter, watercolorist of the first half of the 19th century, up to the middle of the 19th century. But the kind of thing that somebody who was interested um, in old things, but also quite old fashioned, um, might have on their walls. Um, and the, the center painting here dates from around about 1790. It's a watercolor actually of a prison um, uh, by an unknown architect. Um, and the other painting on the other wall is just a, an anonymous painting of a, um, a probably a, a European woman in, um, uh, kind of oriental dress, as they would have called it at the time. Uh, the, the, the objects that actually do have a, a performative task in the play is the, in this, in uh, Tomlin's scenes at least, is this little um, cruet set, which dates from around about 1880. It's a little silver plated cruet with a, um, a pepper pot, a mustard pot, and a salt pot. They, they didn't have salt things, so they'd spoon it out. And um, Sam Tomlin knocks it over in the play. Um, if you've seen the play or um, are about to see the play, you'll see that being toppled over. So that's a kind of genuine um, object from the late 19th century, um, which has a, um, a, performative, a performative task in, the, in Tomlin's scenes, at least. And the objects that have a direct relationship um, to an antique dealer are these very strange objects. And there's a, there's a kind of set of them in the middle there. They look um, pseudo-medieval. They've got like horn... Um, handles on them. They're made of stainless steel. Uh, they were designed by an antique dealer called Amias Phillips, um, who owned Phillips of Hitchin, very famous antique dealer established in 1882. Um, and these were designed in the 1920s, so slightly after this period, for Lord Moyne, um, for his, his house uh, at Bailiff's Court, which is now a hotel in the, south in the southeast of England. Um, and the Tantalus is also mentioned in, in the script. Uh, this is a Tantalus with three decanters in here, um, from tantalizing, you know, after tantalus, he puts his hand in the river. Um, so that's why it's, it's to stop you kind of wanting those objects. In the play, of course, Quinny is um, forcefully making himself an honest dealer. He hates rubbish, as he says. And it's a really interesting contrast with Sam Tomlin, 
who's the guy that actually fakes the chairs, or at least is a participant in the faking of the chairs. And that trope, if you like, that recurring story about dealers and fakes and forgeries, was, it was actually running through this period in 1915. There were a lot of uh, books that were published about how to detect fakes and forgeries if you're a collector. There are also um, increasingly um, autobiographies of, of uh, antiques themselves who also reveal the tricks of the trade in the 1920s and 30s. So this is a really important period, if you like, 1915 to 20, that begins to crystallize um, honest dealers as against dishonest dealers. Uh, and I guess in the play, um, Vashel, who's the author of the play, is playing with that trope. Um, he sets up Quinney as the honest dealer against Tom Tomlin, who's just interested in money. He's not interested in antiques, so he is by definition somebody who doesn't understand beauty. And therefore, it shouldn't be really buying and selling antiques, I guess, is what Quinney would say.